One of the most fundamental designs to any video game is the concept of correctly scaling the difficulty or challenges of the game to that of the player's progression. Basically put, as you become stronger, the world you continue to explore becomes stronger too. One of the best examples of this is the map of Fallout 4 itself. As you manoeuvre through the main story of the game, the areas you explore become more and more difficult as the expected enemy levels increase. Here is a neat little heat map that shows you the expected enemy levels throughout the game. Pretty cool. As you can see, you start the game in the northwest and slowly move your way down both east and south, which in turn becomes more and more hostile and dangerous. This is normal stuff you would see in almost any RPG, but it's important to clarify that the enemies you encounter along the way have a level of progression to them that's reflected in various ways. But the most important way that enemy progression is displayed in Fallout 4 is arguably through the use of visual design. For example, in Sanctuary, when you start off, you kill these little overgrown bugs that occupy the few spaces. You know, bloat flies, red roaches, you're essentially cleaning up the home slate and performing some very simple pest control. As you manoeuvre southeast towards Concord, you start to encounter more dogs and mole rats, and even come across your first human opponent, being that of the simple raider. These guys have shoddy armour and pipe pistols and they basically serve no threat at all, but as you can see, the level of progression here is pretty obvious. You've moved from killing insects to mammals, but the mammals you encounter are still small-time creatures. As you journey south again through Lexington, you start coming across more experienced raiders, this time with defences like turrets. There are other creatures here too, like maybe a stray red scorpion, and some of the first robot opponents of the game that you may encounter. Again, you move south once more and you're in the centre of Boston. Here the game starts to show its full hand and you start encountering things like gunners, which are essentially upgraded raiders, and super mutants which are a staple of the Fallout franchise. The enemies are getting harder and harder, and even the simple dogs you encountered before are now more significantly difficult and pose a new threat. Eventually, when you enter the outermost edges of the southern area of the map, you start to come across more ridiculous enemies. You have armies of red scorpions, gunners in their own habitat, super mutant bases, yao guais, and even the fabled deathclaw. Now I didn't really need to explain in depth how the progression of Fallout 4's enemies work, but it's important for the sake of this video, because Fallout 4 isn't the only game that does this. No, every Fallout game does this. From the original Fallout, to the obscure PS2 game of Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, to Fallout 3 and even 76. They all have this small ramp up of enemy progression that is fundamentally key to the game of Fallout itself, as it allows the player to slowly build their character and encounter new and harder challenges, whilst exploring the vast majority of the games at hand. Now, although you have this very gradual ramp up of enemy levels, there are some exceptions to this rule that are pretty fondly remembered by fans of the franchise. Usually these come in set pieces as part of main quests, and they usually revolve around you taking down a bigger foe than what you're used to meeting and making a big grand spectacle of it. A good example of this is the first time you arrive at Galaxy News Radio. Essentially, when you roll up to a company free dog inside the station, you are met with a group of Brotherhood of Steel soldiers who assist you in clearing the way. It's only when you're right outside of Galaxy News Radio that you encounter one of the fiercest enemies in the entire Fallout franchise, being that of the Super Mutant Behemoth. And even then, when you have an entire army behind you, the game still gives you a fat man just to make it that much easier. You're not supposed to take this behemoth on single-handedly. This is a team battle, and it takes a lot to even come off on even odds. Even then, if we peered outside of the Fallout franchise and looked at Skyrim, it basically does the exact same thing but with dragons. As you first must clear the dragon from the outside of Whiterun, you're assigned a small task force that must endeavour out to meet this foe face to face. This is again where the game assists you in defeating an enemy that would arguably be outside of your recommended difficulty level. In my opinion, these two instances are set up pretty well because you are given a bunch of teammates with you that assist you in the manner, and it doesn't happen too early on in the game. It happens roughly five, six, maybe seven quests in, which is a good enough time to where the player is used to the game and is comfortable, and having this bigger foe come out of nowhere is usually enough to knock you off guard. 
And that's what's bringing me to the topic of today's video. See, Fallout 4 has its own set piece that I'm pretty sure most players remember fondly as being one of the highlights of the entire game. That being the set piece that is set up in the quest When Freedom Calls. This is the third quest in the game that the player will usually encounter, with the previous two quests being that of War Never Changes, which revolves around the pre-war introduction to the game, and the second quest being that of Out of Time, which requires you to explore Sanctuary and make your way to Concord. Essentially, you could look at When Freedom Calls as being the second main quest the player will usually encounter, when they start exploring the wasteland of Fallout 4. I will argue that When Freedom Calls is part of a grand tutorial that Fallout 4 has, as it introduces a lot of basic mechanics to the game, like human enemies, human allies, the mechanic of power armor, and even the first bobblehead the player will encounter, amongst other various gameplay elements. And in my opinion, this quest is arguably one of the game's most iconic, but the more I think about it, the more I start to blame various problems with the game of Fallout 4 entirely on the shoulders of this one quest. Now, before I start, let me just clarify that I absolutely love the game of Fallout 4. I rank it as my second favorite Fallout game of all time, and I genuinely really appreciate it. To me, it is a flawed game with some glaring problems, but over time I've come to appreciate the wall design and combat of the game. I just reached 1000 hours in Fallout 4 and it is actually my most played game on Steam aside from CSGO. I really have wanted to make this video for a long time and it's just about time that I made it, especially with it being a new year and all. My main problem with this quest can be boiled down to three key points, but in order to understand what it is I'm talking about, Let's walk through the quest entirely to refresh our memories a bit, shall we? After helping out Codsworth and clearing out Sanctuary, in the quest Out of Time, we are situated with the task of going over to Concord, a nearby city, and investigating the noise. Once we make it all the way to Concord, we can see a bunch of low-level raiders attacking a single man atop a really strange-looking building. Once we kill all of the raiders outside on the street, the quest out of time is automatically completed and we are given the quest when freedom calls. It's now that we are tasked with going inside the building as the man atop of the building shouts out to us. Hey, up here, on the balcony. I've got a group of settlers inside. The raiders are almost through the door. Grab that laser musket and help us, please! Once inside, we must empty the place of all raiders again, before eventually meeting the sole survivor atop the building. This is Preston Garvey, and I'm sure most of you guys already knew that. He and his group of survivors are fleeing north to escape the troubles of an unfortunate past. We are tasked with helping him once again, because before we can even finish our dialogue, there is a third wave of raiders right outside. Sturges, one of the followers with Garvey, asks us to receive a fusion core from down below in the museum itself, which can help power some armor left on the roof of the building by a crashed vertebird. Once we receive the core, we can move up to the roof and find this said armor. Now, for most players, this is the first set of power armor you will come across, and the power armor at hand is very strong. But more importantly, it grants us strength to rip off the minigun that's attached to the vertebird crashed upon the rooftop. The raiders pose no threat to us with our power armor and minigun, and before we know it, we've killed the entirety of the raiders attacking Concord. But as we make our way down to the end of the street, we are tasked with defeating one last foe. That's right, a Deathclaw. Unlike the raiders before, the Deathclaw is actually hard to kill. However, with the power armor at hand, the Death Claw is somewhat of a trivial kill. Once this is all done and we've cleared out Concord, we can head back to Preston to recap with the gang. Once we're inside, Mama Murphy will point out the importance of Diamond City, whilst Preston clears out and tells us to meet him in Sanctuary. Once we finally get back to Sanctuary, the quest completes and we're done with Freedom Calls. It's a pretty short quest with a lot of combat in it, and it introduces a few game mechanics like I had mentioned before. Overall, this quest is amazing, 
and I really do think that it is a very good introduction to a few of the mechanics at hand, most importantly being that of raiders, because you get to see them in a negative light as they're attacking a bunch of friendly people. I do think that this is actually one of the coolest moments in any Fallout game, and I really, really want to like it. But, in a weird way, I just can't. So let's do it. Let's dive into the three main reasons why I don't like this quest, but more specifically, the set piece that happens with the combat in the second half. The power armor in Fallout 4 is hands down the best in the franchise. It's got way more variety in this game, and it acts like an actual shell you physically enter instead of just another suit of armor. And it looks pretty awesome too. To me, it's the most immersive power armor and truly encapsulate what it must feel like to be in a complete chunk of solid metal. And I wasn't surprised to see that you guys actually agree with me, which was nice to see. It's just that power armor has two main issues. Like I said, it's very immersive, so the armor is very clunky and slow. And it's kind of overpowered too. Like, pretty overpowered. Here is a side-by-side -side shot of me taking damage with power armor and without it, and the difference is incredible. Which you could argue is the point of such armor, but why then is it given to you in the literal third quest in the game? Second quest out of the vault. In both Fallout 3 and New Vegas, you obtain power armor beyond the halfway mark of the game, and that's even if you have the knowledge on how to get it. The games of Fallout 3 and New Vegas understand that power armor is very strong, and therefore hide it away until the time is right. Now sure, there are very, very obscure ways of getting the power armor early in both these games, like how you can complete Anchorage in Fallout 3 to get the winterized power armor, and also how in New Vegas you can complete Arcade Ganon's questline for power armor training as early as possible. But these aren't the first quest in either of the games, and arguably aren't really possible to obtain without either completing a DLC or exploring the wasteland with a companion that is pretty hard to unlock. There is also the power armor training you can get from the Brotherhood of Steel in New Vegas as well, but even then, that requires you to do some exploring and venturing out into the wasteland before it's obtainable, which means that you have to go out and kill things and explore before you're given the power armor. However, in Fallout 4's case, this is handed to you right at the start, which is made worse by the fact that Power Armor is fundamentally stronger in Fallout 4 than in any previous 3D title. When you actually think about it, Fallout 4 should be locking away this Power Armor longer than any other game, but it really doesn't. I'm not saying that they should nerf the Power Armor, it's fucking Power Armor, it's supposed to be strong and tanky. It just shouldn't be given to you this early on because it pretty much trivializes the combat for the rest of the game. Now, to me, this point is probably the weakest point of the entire video, but I'm gonna add it in anyways because I still think it's worth talking about. The minigun in most of the Fallout games is a pretty strong weapon, which is where, again, the game of Fallout 4 is completely different. The minigun in Fallout 4 is... bad. It's a great weapon early on, but it really struggles to keep up into the middle to late game period which is weird for a weapon that is pretty damn good in almost any of a Fallout title. And I believe it's because of the When Freedom Calls quest. See, if the player was to receive a strong-ass weapon here alongside the armor, they would basically stroll through the rest of the game, as almost all the information around enemy levels shown earlier in the video would become somewhat obsolete. This is where the problem stands, really. You have the minigun in this quest, but it's nerfed for this quest, meaning one of the staple weapons of the Fallout franchise, is basically toned down, especially late game. And you can argue that the game doesn't even get this right, as even then, the minigun is still strong enough to carry you through these low-level areas, with the main issue being that of ammunition. Do you start to see the issues yet? The game is absolutely ruining its own pacing just to have this one cool, awesome set piece early in the game. You're handed this monstrous armor and beefy weapon in order to swipe down a deathclaw, but in doing so, the next couple of areas just become a breeze. Like mentioned earlier, I think that Fallout 4's combat is probably its strongest point, and you're essentially ruining the combat of the game early on by giving you this monstrous armor and really big beefy weapon because you don't have to peek around corners and take your time anymore. 
the combat that was supposed to be small firearms and maybe pipe weapons early on when you go through things like Concord and Lexington have essentially been replaced with you being this big chunky guy in power armor just running around with a minigun and blasting people to bits. It really sucks because there is a lot of potential here early game to have some very thrilling and engaging combat where you put the player in kind of difficult scenarios that they can maneuver through as the game progresses before they get to the higher caliber weapons that you find later on. But instead, you just do this. Now, the Teflor is a fabled creature in Fallout lore. Even for residents of the world itself, a Deathclaw is the scariest of creatures that they might encounter. This is something you have to work towards, even becoming close to defeating in both the previous 3D titles. And even then, the Deathclaw will catch up to you in moments and instantly kill you. And in a way, the Fallout 4 Deathclaw is arguably better than they are in the previous titles, as it's still the same grotesque and strong creature it's known to be, but you've just killed one at level 4 in the game. So, what's that all about? That enemy level map that I showed you has been overran once again, and sure set pieces have done this in the past, like with Galaxy News Radio and Fallout 3, but in that game it's the sixth quest in the main story, which is given to you after you've explored a few other areas prior. And even then, the game doesn't give you a ridiculously strong set of armor to overcome this enemy, instead it gives you a bunch of soldiers who can help you take it down. And arguably one of the best points of the Fallout 3 Behemoth encounter is the fact that it's not just down the road from the start of the game. In Fallout 3, you have to make your way to Megaton and then make your way through DC, which requires you to go through various tunnels and other set locations. And even then, the Megaton quest requires you to do various little miscellaneous stuff in order to actually get the quest from Moriarty. What I'm trying to say is that Fallout 3 makes you earn this set piece, whereas Fallout 4 basically hands it to you as early as it can. I know this is really stupid and a dumb argument to argue, but I can't help but feel like the game is throwing everything at you right at the start in order to be very impressive. And it works, it is impressive. It's a really cool experience and it's a very cool quest, but I can't help but feel like it results in the pacing of the next couple of hours being a little bit off. And sure, RPGs tend to have multiple crescendos along its storyline, usually tied to each new area or chapter that's explored, but I don't think Fallout 4 does that at least not in the main story. I know it's stupid, but I can't help but think that this entire quest would feel just as cool if they replaced the Deathclaw with a, let's say, super mutant and also just got rid of the power armor altogether. Meaning that they can save the power armor for another quest much later down the line that is also a set piece and arguably harder to complete. This way you still get the cool human on human action in the first couple of hours of the game and you also get introduced to a new creature that is big and strong. Just not a creature that is as fabled as the Deathclaw, just something small like a super mutant or maybe even a mile look. You can use this quest to introduce us to something new, but don't make it a Deathclaw because you're essentially going from 2 to 10 on like the ridiculous scale. Like I said, it's a really cool quest, but I really don't think it's used at the right time. I just think that this ruins the next couple of hours of pacing, especially all the way up to Diamond City, as you are given something that is not only really strong in that being the power armor, but you've also killed a creature that is way harder than anything else you're going to face for like the next 10 hours. Also, you could make arguments as to the minigun being strong or not, but what fundamentally matters here is the game is giving you a good weapon, when usually up until this point you've been scrapping over maybe a 10mm or a pipe weapon, which are still pretty decent in their own right but not as good as a minigun. In conclusion, I believe that the quest of When Freedom Calls is a good example of how a set piece can ruin the flow of any open world game, especially if you need to hand to the player a very broken set of armor that just results in the rest of the game becoming a joke. You also have this weird roller coaster of enemy progression that just feels odd. You go from killing insects and dogs to murdering a Deathclaw, one of the hardest enemies in all of Fallout, 
to then going back to killing dogs and bugs again until you reach Lexington. The quest gives you this weird high that is almost impossible to get down from. For the next couple of hours, it really feels like you're not doing anything progressive. I really feel like there's a bitter taste left in my mouth whenever I go through this quest, and I genuinely think that this quest could function the same without the power armor or with the death claw being replaced. Now, of course, this is my subjective view on the quest and its place within Fallout 4, and I would love to see what you guys think about this topic down below. I'm interested to see if other players even noticed this roller coaster of accomplishments, or if this is something I'm just being weird about. Either way, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. As always, more content to come, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.